let out a great shout. Say great shout. What is God asking you to let out a great shout over? Can I be honest with you? Some of you aren't aware of how you look. You're not aware of how your face looks. You you just ain't. You just ain't. (laughs) It was supposed to be funny, but the truth is, God made you a pretty baby, but you choose to have an ugly face sometimes. It's like there's a world term called like resting something face. Anyways, I I digress. I'll let you go on Google. But some of us aren't aware that our body doesn't testify of the goodness of God. And the truth is, God made you better than that. He made you beautiful. He made you powerful. He made you, he said, listen, if if we believe this, mighty are the works of his hands. And if we believe we were created in the image of God, then when I, then when an unbeliever sets eyes on me, they should see something good looking back at them. And I'm not just talking about vanity. I'm saying, y'all, listen, sometimes up here it's rough looking at y'all because it's, it's giving entertain me. Tell me something I don't know. Tell me something that move me. That's what it's giving. But I declare that you are created for such a time as this, that whenever someone looks on you, they see the glory of God because you're not what you've been through. You don't look like what you've been through. You've been through so many storms and God still has you right here. Come on, man. It's something good to smile about. I was told one time, smile, you're at church. I'm going to do my best to be able to just run down what I've got. But say, these walls got to go. Now, come on, say it again. Say, these walls got to go. Now, there's a first picture. Quality, you just go with me. I'll just try to go in order as much as I can. Go to the next one. And the next one. These walls got to go. Now, y'all know me. By trade, this is what I do every single day. And I go in people's houses, and they be like, oh, well, we're just wondering what we could do with the space. And most of the time, I end up saying this phrase, well, these walls, they got to go. If you, want, if you want this space to give what you want, then these walls, they. Anybody ever watched HGTV or you watch some renovation channel and you're like, man, that's just, you know, like it would be really cool to have this type of space. And they're like, I wonder if we could take this wall down. Marcus probably hears that all the time. He's a general contractor too as well. And so like, you know, you hear these things and people are like, is it structurally sound? That's the people who are responsible. The other people who are irresponsible, they just start tearing stuff up. Some wife just says, this this is it. He finally left. I'm ready to tear this wall out. But there's a need to remove walls in your season of life. Some of you have walled yourself off even from the presence of God. So when the presence of God is going, the truth is you act like an unbeliever. How do I know? Because your body your body embodies one who doesn't believe. Wow. Y'all know I've been on this. We know the word says this, that there's power in the fellowship to where even when an unbeliever comes in your gathering, they'll be convicted of sin and be able to repent. When did we make this about us and not about him? Because the results we given is given like it's about us and it's not about him. There are some walls that need to go down. If you're taking notes, this real quick sermonette is called These Walls Got to Go. <laughs> Come on. I want all y'all taking notes. You know what? If you act a part of this church, because your mind ain't that good, Okay. I had a conversation with y'all an hour ago. I don't remember what you said. So if you're serious about growing in Christ, say growing in Christ, then you'll do the things that it needs to actually grow in Christ. Otherwise, it's pride. I don't need to write notes. I don't need it. I know my Bible. 
I'm a professional Christian. Pride. Pride. And we're so arrogant to come into the Lord's house thinking that we just got it all together. And then when we talk to Christians, we feel like we got to like front. And so we say all the Jesus talk, but we're really weak. And those of you who are strong in the Bible, I'm telling you, stand up. Not right now, like not that, but I'm saying stand up in your faith. Stand up in your faith. Stand up. Get in your Bible. Get in your word. Why does your wife not know you know you love the word? She knows you love it, but you never share that with her. I'm tired of the church beating up on men. So listen, here, here's another way to put it. Do you understand that because we don't understand Jewish culture, we have a weak depiction of what the world really looks like right now. So some of you think that we're praying for Israel and it's just like, to you it's just like another political thing. No, we're praying for Israel because we actually have a faith that is a descendant of Jewish heritage. You can't hate Jewish people and be a Christian. The problem is, the American church doesn't know their history. This is how you could come out your mouth with some anti-Semitic type stuff. Or anti-Palestinian for that. Right? There, it, listen, we're talking about a battle between two cousins that can't see that they cousins. Abraham had a situation. <laughs> like y'all, you know, some of y'all got them situations where he got tired of waiting on the promise. And so he produced the Ishmael. And the Lord says this about, I'm not even going, get the Christian. Y'all, we'll come back to this. My good, this is the word. Y'all, do y'all want the word? Do y'all want like, you want to do a cute sermon? I got it. But this is what he's downloading right here. Listen, listen. God tells Abraham this. He says, you know what? Even though you're outside of timing, <laughs> I'm still, when Abraham sends them off, he sends Ishmael off and his mom. He says, I will make you a great nation. But Ishmael wasn't the promise. Second son is the promise. This is where our lineage comes from. If you don't understand that we've been grafted in, you will only be geopolitical and miss the spiritual significance of living in 2023 where the Lord actually desires for his church to wake up. These walls got to go. These walls got to go. Listen, you know, <laughs> bad news sells. So <laughs> no one's catching that there's Palestinians somewhere actually worshiping God and actually being, rep, being actually gripped by the presence of God. And there's Israelis who are actually dropping weapons with the same Palestinian because they recognize there's something more in God that's unifying. But bad news sells. And some of y'all waiting for the whole thing to implode. You're like, well, this is the time. Well, what you going to do if this is the time? If this is the time that all the nukes just go off, what you going to do? I just hate it. I, I hate some of that. But listen, we don't have spiritual eyes. We can't see that we are actually of a Jewish lineage. By how? By how? Ask me how I know. Jesus. Now, go to Ephesians 2. This is where we're going to make it all come together because these walls got to go. Ephesians 2, starting at verse 11, it says, there, Therefore, remember that one time you were what? In the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called circumcision, which is made in flesh and hands. Remember that you were at that time, what? Separated from Christ. Come on, say separated. All of us act like we're the hero of the story in the Bible. But unless you're actually a Jew in this building, like I mean lineage Jew, like blood Jew, you are a Gentile, separated from things of God. Se say separated. See, because we all want to think that we just been a part of this glorious plan from the beginning, and we got that state of entitlement, like I told you last week, so we just read the Bible like we've always been grafted in. Paul writes this. He says, remember that you at one time were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of the promise. Why? Because God said to Abraham, he says, through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. There's a promise that's coming through you. I'm going to bless all your descendants, Abraham. 
even your messed up ones, even your ones where you get in a situation, some of y'all should really, really have grace with yourself. If Abraham can have it accounted to him as righteousness because he actually believed God, why don't we release what we're holding over ourselves from yesterday, yesteryear, and believe God for right now? The covenants of the promise. Having no hope. Say no hope. Come on, say no hope. And without God in the world, you were once living without God. You were once alienated from the promises of the covenant. Everyone say, but. Verse 13 says, but I love God's big butts, and they cannot lie. That was just to make sure you was with me. But now in Christ Jesus, in who? Come on, in who? You were once, you once were far off, have an, uh, and have been brought near by the blood of Christ for himself is our peace. Who has made us both one, say one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Say these walls gotta go. These walls gotta go. See, I... Y'all don't remember, but a few years ago when our whole world was just like upended and it seemed like race wars was all over the place and it just seemed like you couldn't find two Christians to, to agree, especially if they were black and white or if they were different backgrounds. We couldn't find these common grounds. Why? Because I think that that was a prototype and a forecasting of where we are today where now you won't even have Christians who can even back the state of Israel because we don't know who we are. So anything that looks a little bit political, you say, oh, I don't want to touch that. I don't want to touch that, JP, because that's too political. No, it's not political. This is spiritual. Do you know they are not fighting over a land the piece the size of New Jersey? No. They're fighting for spiritual inheritance and rights. Read your Bible. In Daniel, it is foretold that there are anti Like, with the picture that we live in right now, could it be that what the Christians are waiting for as the Antichrist is what the Muslims are waiting for as their Messiah? We quiet. Because we don't know our Bible. We don't know who we are. They're closer to Israel. And I'm not talking about the Israel that was established in the 1940s. I'm talking about Israel that's over 2,000, 4,000 years old. I'm talking about the Israel that whenever Jacob wrestled with God, he changed his name to, that's who we're talking about. That is what's under attack. Not the political state, the city state that was actually brought in in the 40s. This is a spiritual thing. Are you with me? Listen. If you stay on the news lines, you'll get played every time. The news will have us thinking that this room couldn't exist. Well, you'd never be in a room that looks this diverse. The news would say that. <clears throat> the news would say that if someone's speaking Spanish in church, you would never come back to the church because it's clearly not your thing. When heaven is loud and heaven is so diverse. When did diversity become a cuss word? God is multifaceted. Mighty are the works of his hand. And when you're uncomfortable, you got to just have enough intelligence to say, I'm uncomfortable. Don't get mad. Anger is a secondary response to you not feeling safe. So when some of you pop off with me, I don't really get mad. At <laughs> you think that that anger going to move me? That is a spirit. And I'm waiting for it to be cast off you. You can't greet the holiness of God and stay in those spirits at the same time. One has to go. You can't love God and love mammon at the same time. Some of our love of money is rooted in our security and our, and, and, and our scaredness that we will not have enough of him. So as new people come in, we begin to just hold it tight because somehow, there won't be enough of God in the future. That's a lie. It's a lie. You know it when you hear me say it. It's a lie. Let me get back to the Bible so I don't make you guys nervous. But say these walls got to go. 
the dividing walls of hostility. Verse 15, by abolishing the law of the commandments expressed in the ordinances, that he might create in himself, say, one, one new man in the place of two. Hallelujah. When you're praying for Israel, when you're praying for Israel, pray this right here. Pray that he might make one where there was two. Because that's his heart. That's his heart. If you're praying for anything else, you're getting played. Verse 16. And might reconcile us both, say both, to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. These walls got to go. Real quick, here's some notes for you, and you'll be able to dig into this this week. The first wall that's got to go in your life in this season is the wall of pride. If me and you are to become who we're created to be and who God says we are, then the wall of pride has to fall. Amen? Pride is pretty deceptive in nature. It makes us feel invincible while trapping us in isolation. Say isolation. Pride also separates us from the love of God and the will of God while masking us sometimes in religious opportunity. Pride. The wall of pride. Second wall. Say second wall. What was the first wall? The second wall is this. The wall of fear. Say fear. Some of you need to turn the TV off. You say that God won't speak to you, but you spend hours like it's your job in front of a TV getting literally programmed. You're getting programmed. It's called programming. You're wondering why you don't have a prayer life because you're getting programmed by the systems of the world. And it's producing the systems of the world in your life. The wall of fear. There's a crippling effect of the wall of fear. It actually has a cousin called anxiety that will actually manifest in your life. Fear keeps us from stepping into the promises of God. Say the promises of God. Fear is incompatible with faith. Write that down. Fear is incompatible with faith. I'm not talking about something that you got to fake it. I'm saying that when you feel the spirit of fear on you, just know you got to you just got to acknowledge that hey, that's fear. Lord, I surrender that to you. I invite your presence in. Give me grace for more faith. Amen. So what was the first wall? The first wall was pride. The second wall is fear. The third wall is the wall of sin. Say sin. Right before that, I'm going to give you a, a, a reference scripturally for the wall of fear. Some of you need to dig there because that is the currency of this age, and most of you have been baptized in fear. 2 Timothy 1 and 7 says this, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but the power and love and a sound mind. You got a good mind. You're not depressed. You just need to really exercise. Y'all, you know how many, how many things I watch on social that would have me thinking, oh, you're depressed. You're, eight, you're entering close to a midlife something, and you're, you're so sad about your goal. No, 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 no. I haven't been outside. I ain't drank enough water, and I ain't walked enough. I'm eating junk food, so my body feels sucky. It ain't depression when I'm not doing the work. Now, you do the work, honey. You do all that work. And so the pressure still try to sit on you. Now, let's take it to the blood of Jesus. Still. Depression doesn't look like it's going to win, does it? I digress. Y'all like to, you know, some people like to just, like, stay sad forever. I'm sorry. I can't do it. Because the effects of it is death. Come on. Third wall, the wall of sin. Say sin. I know that sin is unpopular to talk about in churches nowadays. I don't get it. I don't understand why, but it's really unpopular to really talk about sin. And how sin, it acts as a partition separating or cutting us off from the fulfillment of our relationship with God. Sin tries to produce a counterfeit to make us depend on it more than depend on God. Sin makes us think that we're reliant on ourselves. The walls of sin. 
Do you know how many times I get with Christians and I say, hey, is there anything I can pray for you about? And everyone's there crickets. Y'all, it's a bunch of liars. Why do I expose it? Because the enemy wants you to just stay there. Stuck. Not testifying. Because why? The Bible says this. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the... So if he can silence your testimony, he got you stuck. He already got you. You ain't got to worry about overcoming. Stay stuck, y'all. You might as well wear it as a t-shirt. I'm stuck. Because <laughs> I'm not testifying. I ain't thinking about the blood of the Lamb. I'm stuck. If I had a big old t-shirt and it just said, Stuck. <laughs> Listen, I know we were talking about vision. We'll talk about it in a few weeks. We got time. We got time. But here's, here's the thing. There are three walls that have got to come down today. That first wall is the wall of pride. The second wall is the wall of, and the third wall is the wall of, let me give you Bible. There are cascading effects. First, before I give you Romans, there are cascading effects of sin that impacts your everyday life. Sin will have you separated thinking that you are so far from God when you are really right there. He is present to you, but sin will blind you and make you actually attach with shame. Some of you know shame more than you know the spirit of the living God because sin has blinded you. It's kind of like when you, when you, when you get, <laughs> it's like when you break a diet and you're like, man, I already done broke it for breakfast. I might as well just have a cheat day. It, a cheat meal turns to a cheat meal, cheat meals, cheat days, cheat weeks, cheat months. Y'all don't think it's funny, but that's how we are with sin. God calls us, then we play with sin and we're like, ah, oh, man, I messed up. So I might as well just mess up again. Again, again. Now, you've done something for 20 days. Guess what it is now? It's a habit. But, but whoo, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. If you can start a habit, you can reverse a habit. Who's going to start today 20 days fresh with something? Who's going to be 20 days clean in 20 days? I don't know what your thing is, but who's going to be 20 days clean in 20 days that you said on this particular Sunday, I decided to get that up? I decided that I'm not going to forfeit my inheritance for a pot of stew. I'm not going to forfeit my inheritance for some perverted images, for some crazy wickedness in my mind, for some, I don't know what your thing is. <laughs> Whatever sin is to you, I trust that he reveals it to you, but I'm not going to forfeit my inheritance. Esau forfeited his inheritance. He sold his birthright for a pot of stew. Don't be tricked out of your inheritance. Segway, don't be tricked this trick-or-treating. It is not pleasant. It is not all fun and games. I'm not going to make these crazy statements. I just want you to know this. If you're serious about the next generation, ask God about Hol Halloween. Just ask him. I don't care what you believe. I really don't. I said, if you're serious about the next generation, ask God about Halloween. Drop the mic. There we go. All right. Last thing, here's your call to action. Say, what's my call to action? Identify the walls in your life and begin doing work this week to tear them down. See, some people in church don't like work. Y'all love a good time. You love the presence. You love me preaching. You're happy. Now, if I can really just come and bring and just be all sweating and just yelling and all, ooh, the spirit move. But when I give you homework... <laughs> See, because the thing about homework is you can tell if somebody did the work or not. Some of you love the excuse so much that I'm giving you the keys to freedom, and you're like, nah, but I like this cage. I like this shame. I'll never say I'm a victim, but I'm given victim tendencies. <sighs> oh, my goodness. These walls got to go. These walls got to go. Got to, got to go. Stand to your feet. We done. Y'all know, I know y'all looking at your clock and thinking about lunch and all that stuff. Hear me. There's a way that we've been baptized in the American church and in the Western society that we've lost all power because we'd rather play church. Yeah? I'm going to give you an opportunity right now. We're going to take communion and we're going to end our service. There's going to be two ways. We're not going to come back for a song and do that whole thing. We're going to take communion. And uh, Kuala, can you give me that, that last slide there? 
Say communion and say commitment. Every Sunday, we want to make room for communion and for commitments. It's not that I don't believe in the thought of rededicating your life or none of that, but there is a commitment that everyone has to make to God every single week to commit to the mission of Christ every single week. If you don't have communion, can you raise your hand? We'll try to get it for you. Should it, you could be able to get it. Uh, if you don't have it, just raise your hand. We'll get it to you. And the other part of this is this. In, make, in making commitments, I'm not going to say all, how, all heads bowed and all eyes closed. Because Jesus says this, if you'll deny me before my father, I'll deny you. There, if, if you'll be ashamed of me on earth, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. And so I want to give you opportunity, if you're going to make a commitment today, I want to give you opportunity for that to, to, for that to have an opportunity to take a root. In a second, I'm going to give you a chance to raise your hand if that's what you want. I know it's what I want. Y'all, I feel good in my faith. I feel great. I'm loving. I'm loving what the Lord is doing. Is it easy? No. But I feel that we are on to what the Lord is doing. So if you came in here today and you feel the Holy Spirit pulling on you and you just recognize and you say, you know what, today I need to commit myself again. I need to commit myself. Here in a moment, I'm going to give you the opportunity to slip your hand up and we're going to celebrate with you. We're going to celebrate with the people in this room who are making that commitment. You're not looking around. You, by faith, you already know that the Spirit of the Lord is going to do that every single time. But what you're doing to, so that you don't become like a Pharisee is you're looking for places in your life that you can commit further to the cause and the mission of Christ. In a moment, we're going to do that. But before we do that, I just want to remind you of what communion is. We share in the suffering in the body of Christ when we take communion. We remind, we're reminded of what he done for us, that we could not do it on our own, that he took on our sin. And so right now, we just take a moment to reflect on, Father, what you done through your body. And Father, right now, I just ask, I ask God, you give us sobriety of what we're doing, that this is a holy moment before you. And God, before we take your communion, those who are right here who are wanting to commit, I just ask you to slip your hand up and just say, I want to commit to God. We're just going to just clap. Can y'all clap? Can y'all give, can y'all give it up for these people? People, I thank them for making for making a decision today. This is a courageous decision for some, for some of you to be able to say, I want to go a step further. Now, let's take communion together. Let's break this, which is symbolic of his body, and let's take that together. Now, we're going to talk about his blood, and this juice is symbolic of his blood. But I believe that there's still many of you who or still in that place that say, you know what, I really want this to be a fresh start, but JP, I've had a lot of fresh starts before. I've started and stopped. I've started and stopped. I've started and stopped. I believe that the day is the day of salvation for you if you believe it. Amen? So, Father, it's, it's in your spirit that we look at this cup, and which is symbolic of your blood, and we take it, God. We don't take it unworthily. We take it Having examined ourselves, that's saying that we need you and that we want to commune with your body and this one. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Let's take this together. One final step. If you had someone slip their hand up around you, I want you just to reach towards them. There are some people that are around you who are making courageous decisions. And we just want to pray right now that they don't leave out of this room without support. That no one leaves out of this room without support. And so what I want us to do, if you don't have people around you, can you just grab the, her, the person's hand beside you? Everybody link up. Let's just grab the people's hands around us. You're going to love them by force and they don't have a choice. Come on. Grab a hand. Father, we came together today as your church, and God, we didn't come to be entertained, but we thank you for meeting with us. We thank you for engaging our heart with your mission. And now, God, I ask you, Lord God, God, that, that you would enlarge the territories of those who are holding the hands right now. 
Come on, we just say that together. Say enlarge. Come on, say enlarge my territory. Enlarge the territories of the hands I'm holding. Connect my heart with your church. Connect my heart with your mission. I'm here. I'm yours forever. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And you got some great people around you. We'll see you next Sunday. Talk to a few people. We'll see you.